Good morning and welcome to Temple Baptist Church uh, online worship. It's interesting to be sitting in our auditorium this morning and looking around for your faces, but none of you are here, of course. And uh, Brother David's here. I appreciate him. We're going to be doing this for the next few weeks or until we're able to meet again, but uh, let me just welcome you to our, our worship this morning. We're going to look into the Word. We're going to hear a video uh, that promotes our uh, North American missions offering, but it's it's glad that we have tech. I'm glad that we have technology that uh, allows us to be able to do this when we can't meet. But um, let's uh, begin this morning by looking into the Word of God. We're going to look at God's Word. One of the questions I think that's coming to the minds of of all of us, even as God's people, but especially people who who aren't who don't know the Lord, is if if God is a God who's in control of everything and he's a good God, why is there so much suffering going on? We're going to look at, see what the Bible has to say to that. So if you have your Bible, open it to Job chapter 42, verses 1 through 6. This is the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord today. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You ask... Who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said I will question you and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. May the Lord bless um, the reading of his word. Let's, let's go to pr uh, have a word of prayer together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word, Lord, that has been preserved down through the centuries. We, we thank you for the, the instruction that we get from it. Lord, I pray that during this time of the COVID 19 virus, as it spreads throughout the world, that you would give us a sense of confidence in you, deliver us from our human fears, help us to trust in you. We pray today for those who've been directly affected by this, those who've lost loved ones, give them comfort. Those who are fighting the virus right now, we pray for healing. We pray for our medical personnel, doctors and nurses and frontliners who are dealing with this. We pray for your protection over their lives. And Father, I just want to lift up our congregation to you during this time. I pray a hedge of protection about us. And Lord, give us wisdom all to listen to the right things. And give us discernment, Lord, not to uh, get uh, to overreact to, to what's going on, but to trust in you. Deliver us from our fears. Speak to us today th from your word, Lord. Use this, uh, this medium as we send out this message online to speak to people's hearts. We commit this time to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You know, the, the church is the only organization that exists for the benefit of its non-members. Most organizations organize because of their members. And, you know, in, in a sense, the church is for us as, as God's people, but, but we're also uh, an organization that, that reaches out and is seeking to minister to and reach others. And uh, therefore, I think even during the time when we're not able to meet, we're asking God to grow our faith and to grow our families and our future um, as we work through this and as we move through this difficult, challenging time. But let me just encourage you, your, your willingness to give, to continue to give to the, the Lord's work of your, your time and your effort and of your means, and to sacrifice for the sake of others, most of us are doing that now, it speaks volumes about how much you love the Lord and how much you love other people, and especially people who don't know the Lord. So I want to commend um, all of us as we seek to, to work together in this time. But this, today we're going to look at a, the most commonly asked question about God 
someone has called it the Achilles heel of Christianity, it's the question of why is there pain and suffering in the world if God is good and if God is in control, why is there so much pain and suffering going on right now around the world? Many, many people actually point uh, to the problem of, of evil and pain as their reason for not believing in God. And you know, you've heard me say it several times, if, if you're not going through a hard time right now, just wait, you will. You're either going through a, a difficult time or you just came out of one or you're getting ready to go into one. That's the, that's the nature of living in a fallen world as we're going to see from what the Bible says. Pain is guaranteed for anyone who takes on the task of living in our fallen world. But, you know, going through, through times like this keeps, we, we keep, echo, we have these, a couple of questions that keep coming up, and, and you're going to hear me say this over and over again because I think this is the issue for many people. If, if God is all-powerful, He's all-powerful, if He's good, then why, why suffering? Why pain in this world? What, can't, couldn't He stop it? What, why does God allow uh, this pandemic or bad things, why does God allow these things to happen? Well, I, I, I really believe that this is, this is not just an intellectual issue that's packaged in a sermon that I'm giving today. I believe it is intensely emotional and, per, and it is personal. We see this from the scriptures. In Psalm uh, 10, verse 1, listen to the psalmist as he cries out to God. He says, Why, why O Lord, do you stand far away why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? I think that's what a lot of people are saying today. Or as Habakkuk puts it in Habakkuk 1, chapter 1, verse 2, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? What I would like to point out from God's Word today is that you know, there is a helpful distinction between micro and macro reasons for suffering. The, the small reason, but the bigger reasons. Uh, micro and macro reasons. We don't know most of the reasons why we suffer uh, on a micro level. In other words, why, why is it happening this way or why is it happening to me? Why is it happening to them and not happening to others? Why now? Why, why is this lo so long? You know, we don't know how long uh, we're going to uh, be in this kind of a situation. Uh, we, we, don't know. We, we don't know those micro reasons, but the Bible is really clear that there are some, some macro reasons that help us find some purpose in our problems in this world. There's, there's at least four macro reasons for why there's pain and there's suffering in the world. The first one is, is uh, from the book of Genesis. Moral evil has been unleashed. Listen to Genesis 1.26. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. God made humans in his likeness. God created Adam and Eve in his image with the ability to make rational choices. And then Genesis 1.31 says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was good. Now God did not, God did not create evil. He created the possibility of evil when he created human beings in his image, and they could make rational choices. He, he gave Adam and Eve some moral perimeters and he told them what they could do and what they couldn't do. In Genesis 2, 16 and 17, the Bible says this. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And by, we know that by disobeying the standards, every one of us has been born with that same rebellious bent toward sin. 
We're all, the Bible says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you may, you may wonder, you know, why God doesn't step in and prevent people from doing bad things to others. Or you could think about 9-11, you know, uh, God surely could have stopped the terrorist on 9-11. God could keep us from, keep, keep evil from happening, but in a sense we would be like robots, wouldn't we? When sinful people make decisions, God allows the, those decisions to play out and sometimes the consequences result in bad things happening to us and to other people. And so we're living in a world where moral evil has been unleashed. That's one of the macro reasons why there is pain and suffering in the world. The second one is the earth is now an environment of disease and death. Uh, you remember before Adam and Eve rebelled against God, there, there were no earthquakes, there were no hurricanes, there were no natural disasters, there was, there was no disease, there was no COVID-19, there were no diseases. But when they sinned, when they chose to disobey God, the Bible says that creation was cursed. Genetic disorders and multiple diseases were unleashed to do their work of destruction. Pain and death became a part of, of what it means to be human. Genesis 3, 17 and 18 said, God said, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall, bring forth, shall it bring forth to you. You see, their disobedience, their sin resulted in uh, personal guilt and shame and alienation, separation from God and, and others, and actually a disruption of, of nature. Uh, Romans, Romans 8 uh, 22 says this, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. So because of Adam and Eve's sin, every person along with the whole planet is suffering. So the second macro reason why there's pain and suffering is the earth that we live on is now an environment of disease and death. Uh, the third big reason, the third big reason that, that we have pain and suffering is that Satan influences people to do evil. You see, he, the devil, Satan, is ultimately behind all of the hatred, the war, the oppression, and evil that's in the world. He, he inflames our passions. He prompts us to make bad uh, choices. Jesus spoke of this. Uh, Jesus said in, in John, 4, uh, John 8, 44, listen, listen to what Jesus said. He said, he's talking about Satan. He said, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth. A murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is the li a liar and the father of lies. That's Satan. Satan influences people to do evil. You, you want to know why, the, one of the big reasons why they're suffering? Satan is at work. And then the final one, which is a, a real big one that I think that we may have difficulty embracing, but God sovereignly weaves His way and His will in this world through suffering. We see this in Jesus on the cross. You see, God is good even when bad things happen, but some of God's reasons for why things happen are beyond our capacity to understand. Listen to Isaiah 55, verse 9. God speaks and he says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And I would just say that during this time, it is, it, it, it's time for each of us to surrender to the, to, to the sovereignty of God 
because all things are under the rule and the reign of God. Nothing happens without his direction and permission. And as followers of Christ, we, we, most of us have memorized Romans 8, 28. It simply says that, that God is working all things together for good to those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. It doesn't say all things are good. It says he's working through those things for good. God is working all things for his glory and for his ultimate for the ultimate good of those who are called to live out his purposes. And so those are, are four big reasons why they're suffering in the world. But, but you know, the Bible is clear, too, that, that it, there, there's at least four good things. There's at least four good things that come out of bad things. The first one is tough times, hard times can stretch us. Uh, listen to James 1, 4, uh, two through four. This is what he says. Count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Hard times stretch us. We're all being stretched now. If you're not being stretched, I, I don't know. We're all being stretched during this time. A second good thing that, and it's good, it's good to stretch us. You know, we don't want to get stuck in, in a rut. We want to be, be a challenge and stretch. The second good thing that comes out of hard times also equip us. It, it, enable us, equip us. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1, 4 says this. Listen to God's word. The God of all comfort comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. During these times, God is using this to equip us to help, help others, to serve others. And then a, a, a third good thing that comes out of bad things is hard times can teach us if we allow them to. God, God may use the bad things that you and I are experiencing to teach us something that he could not teach us in any other way. Uh, listen to Hebrews uh, 12, verses 10 and 11. It says this, God, he disciplines us for our good. He disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but la latter or later, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness for those who've been trained by it. So God uses these times to teach us. Let the Lord, I, I, would, I would urge you during this time, let the Lord teach you what he's trying to teach you. And it may not be the same thing for every person. And then the, the final good thing, that hard times can also get, reach us. You know, sometimes we, we are, uh, get to a point in our lives where we're kind of pushing the Lord away or we're, but hard times, God is able to reach us. C.S. Lewis said this, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience, but he shouts to us in our pains. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. You see, God can use hard times to get our attention, to help us uh, think about the, the eternal realities that need to break through into our lives. And I think that's what the Lord is, is doing in, in, in the situation that we're in now. I, I remember, you may remember when Jesus, in Luke chapter uh, 13, two times in verse 3, in that chapter in verse 5, um, he's admonishing his, his disciples and he says this, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Uh, in this we see the heart of Jesus. The heart of Jesus. Um, he, he reminds us that we're, we're, we're fallen individuals and we are living in a fallen world. And actually every day we should be amazed and thankful that he's given us another day to live because none of us are assured. You know, all that we have in this life and every day of life that we give is, is given by a gift and by the grace of God. And while, while there's still time, Jesus is saying to his disciples, where there's still time, he's calling for repentance. 
Repentance simply means to, to change, to turn to him. And repentance is, for a believer, it's, we, it happens when we trust in Christ, but it, repentance is an over and over thing. It's, we're always changing our minds. We're, we're trying to move in God's direction. When, we're, when, we, when we've moved off the path, we, we move back. One of the most vivid examples of suffering in the Bible is a case study of human suffering in one book that chronicles the life of a man who underwent tremendous and extreme misery. He lost everything. He lost job, his job, he, his possessions, his family, his health, his friends. His name is Job. And when we read the book of Job, we found out that his trust in God wavered. He mourned and wept. He, he protested. He, he questioned God. He, he even cursed the day that he was born. He, he, he desperately wanted to know why all these bad things were happening to him. And God answered him, but the answer wasn't what he was expecting. In chapters 38 and 39, Job comes face to face with the God of nature. And then in chapters 40 through 42, he encounters the nature of God. Look with, look with me at uh, Job chapter 38, verses 1 to 5. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if, you're, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched out the line upon it? God takes Job through a crash course in theology of who God is. God is eternal, while Job has just recently showed up on the scene. And then if you jump down to verses 31 and then verses 34 and 35, uh, listen. God says, can you bind the cluster of the uh, Pelads? Or loose the belt of Orion? In verses uh, 34 and 35. Can, can you lift up your voice to the clouds that an abundance of water may cover you? Can you send out lightnings that, you, that they may go and say to you, here we are? God is the God of creation. We are just human beings. Astronomers believe that there are a hundred billion stars just in our own galaxy. And there are some others... Uh, astronomers as estimate that there could be as many as 130 galaxies apart from our galaxy. Mind-boggling. God is, is, is a, a all-powerful, omnipotent God. And then in chapter 39, basically what God does is he asks Job about 60 different questions about the animal kingdom. He's trying to get Job to see that he, God is God and he is just a man. That's what we need to realize today. But when we come to chapter 40, verses 2 through 5, Job is silenced in the presence of an all-powerful God because he's learning that God, God's person and his plans are greater than anything that he can grasp. Listen to chapter 40, verses 2 through 5. Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I'm vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. As I said, he's silenced when, he, when he's confronted with the nature of God. And then move on down to verses uh, 7 and 8 and listen again. This is Job 40, verses 7 and 8. Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Would you indeed annul my judgment? And then the verses that we read at the beginning, verses 5 and 6 of 42, chapter 42. Here's what Job, he comes to a conclusion. He said, I've heard you, 
by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you, therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. He, he repents. He, he, that means he, he changed his mind and he went in a different direction and, and he started trusting God again. God not only has great might, he's always right. Ultimately, the only answer God gave to Job was himself. Job wasn't, asking, wasn't being asked to trust a plan. He was asked to trust a person, he, to trust in a personal God who is, who is in ultimate control and knows what is best for us. He is God and we are not. And so the real question is not Job's suffering, but whether Job will trust in the sweet, Sovereignty of God. You see, we are in this, these circumstances now that none of us had control over. We, we can't change our circumstances, but we can change how we respond to them. And that's the challenge today. Let me just quickly point out as we close out uh, this time together. There's some life lessons. There's at least four life lessons that we gain from uh, Job. The first one is... We, we need a, a new view of God and a new view of ourselves, just like what happened to Job. God, God is in control. Even when he appears not to be in control, he is still in control. And when we, what we think about God is the most important thing about us. So we need a, 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 an exalted view of God and an honest view of who we are as, as human beings. The second thing we learn from the book of Job is that God's good will for each of us includes suffering sometimes, and that suffering refines us. Um, listen to, to Job 23, verse 10. He's speaking about God, and this is what he said. And he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Yes, God's will for us sometimes involves suffering, but God will use that to refine us. We're called to support those who are suffering. Let me urge you, if you know families that have been affected directly by this, if you know there are people around you in your community, if you know of, of fellow church members who need support now, we need to support. We're called to help those who are suffering and in need. The third lesson we learn is that God's silence is, is not the same as his absence. It's, it's at this time, in times like this, that we must uh, increase our faith in God's promises even when we don't feel His presence. I talked to someone in our congregation this week that was experiencing that. They said, you know, it's, it's kind of depressing just staying here in my home, but I've been, been on my knees, and I've opened up the Bible and let God's promises encourage me. And that's what I encourage you to do during this time. A fourth uh, life lesson that we learn, and a final one from the book of Job, is our response in all of this needs to be repentance. You know, God took on human flesh, and He came and He died on, uh, Jesus died on the cross for us. And the, the mystery of suffering and sin should always take us to the cross, to, should, should always take us to the Savior. If you haven't yet put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, it's time to do that. Repent and, and, and trust in the Redeemer. Job, in Job 19.25, says this, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at last he will stand upon the earth. God's ultimate answer to suffering is Jesus, the incarnation. The best answer to the problem of evil in the world is Jesus Christ who came. God sent His only Son who entered into this world, this earth, this world of suffering, this world of evil and pain, and He, and he, took, he took all of that for you and for me. He took the worst of it for us. He, he died as our substitute. He, he was raised uh, after three days uh, to life as a victor and he ascended into heaven as the conquering king and he's coming back one day. Let me just say in closing, when, when we suffer, we only have two choices. We can hurt with God or we can hurt without God. 
He may not shield us from all the life storms, but He does provide a shelter for us. And so when you are tempted to ask God, why, why did you do this to me? Then look to the cross and ask, why did you do that for me? We have a little saying in our church, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for your word today. Thank you that it teaches us that you're God and we're not. And that even in times like this, when so much suffering is going on in our world, and we see it on the TV, we read it, we look at it on the internet, all the people who have this virus, all the people who've died. And yet we know, Lord, that our only hope is in Jesus. We thank you for your love and your grace and mercy that you showed us when you sent your only, only begotten Son into this world. And Lord, if there's anybody in the sound of my voice listening to this today who hasn't put their faith and trust in you, I pray that this would be the time your Holy Spirit would work on them and lead them to Christ. Continue to help us to trust in you, Lord. If we're not trusting, help, help us to return to our trust and, and look to you and not, not have the fear that, that we're so tempted to have during this time. Watch over our congregation, Lord, and help us to know how best to help one another during this time. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. My name is Kirk Kirkland, and this is the story, the hardest thing my family and I ever attempted. Uh, we were crazy enough to leave everything to move to Cincinnati to plant a church. My wife was nine months pregnant. We just had enough money to kind of pay the rent and survive and put food on the table. We only had just a few pieces of furniture. I remember we had a dining room table, a bed, and just somewhere to lay our, our child. We did not know one person who lived in the city. We didn't have a denomination. We didn't have a network behind us. We were very much on an island, but we were so compelled that we were um, following Jesus. And we advertised for our first service on uh, Easter of 2013, and 66 people from the city showed up on that very first day. I got counsel from another pastor who had made a similar journey. And he says, have you ever heard of North American Mission Board and support what you're doing? You're planting multiple churches. So we re-looked at what it meant to be to be a missionary. We realized that we didn't have to do it alone. And so we voted to plant another church and to join the Southern Baptist Convention. We said that let's do this again. What we've seen God do, God can do it again in the suburbs. And so we committed to planting the second church. Now we're a part of a wider community and family, and we know that we're better together. Um, the training that we've received is the way that we plant churches. When you give to missions, we plant the next church. We go to the next town. We go to the next village. And when you give, lives are changed, plain and simple.